Let's start by meeting a leading authority on the subject, Dr. Atom. Now, observing the professor himself, we can see that his structure resembles, in many ways, something almost as vast as the atom is small, the solar system. And there are certain similarities. Here is the center with electrons in surrounding orbits. Despite this amazing progress, there were still a couple of problems with Rutherford's nuclear model. Firstly, based on the classical electromagnetism of the time, it was known that accelerating charges emit electromagnetic waves. This meant that the electrons should lose energy as they orbit, eventually falling into the nucleus. Secondly, the nuclear model had no way of explaining the interesting absorption spectra of different elements. This is when you shine light through a substance, then pass the light through a prism to disperse it into a spectrum. When we do this, we see these black lines on the spectrum where specific colors of light have been absorbed by the sample. Different substances give us different spectra, so the light is clearly interacting with the atoms in a very specific way, but nobody could explain why or how. That was until a student of both Thompson and Rutherford came along to enlighten the world. A Danish physicist called Niels Bohr published a brand new model for the atom in 1913. Now, to give some background on Bohr's paper, over the last few years, scientists like Max Planck and Albert Einstein had established that light energy could only be absorbed or emitted in discrete quanta, which could be described as particles of light that have very specific energies. These light particles became known as photons, and this quantum theory explained previously confusing phenomena like black body radiation or why hot objects glow the way they do and the photoelectric effect, or why light can liberate electrons from metallic surfaces in the way that it does. Bohr realized that he could apply quantum theory to the electron orbits in the atom. Now, quantum theory involves a huge amount of complicated maths, so I won't go through the calculations in this video, but Bohr was able to calculate that electron orbits were quantized. In other words, the electron orbits could only exist at discrete energy levels which manifested as orbits at specific distances from the nucleus, now known as shells. In Bohr's model, electrons cannot exist in between these shells. Quantization means that electrons can only exist in one of these strictly defined shells. This explains why electrons don't spiral into the nucleus, because they physically can't. They can only exist in these shells. If an electron absorbs a photon of the exact energy of the difference between two energy levels, it will instantaneously jump up to the next one without spending any time in between. When it instantaneously jumps back down, it'll emit the photon again. For bigger jumps, higher energy photons are required. This explains the black lines that can be seen on the absorbance spectra for different elements. They're the exact frequencies of light that correspond to the very specific electron transitions for that element. Bohr's atom is a great model, and it's not too far away from our modern understanding of the atom. In fact, it's still taught in schools today since it's a beautiful simplification of the behavior of the electrons. There were still problems with Bohr's model that were apparent at the time. It was able to explain the hydrogen spectra, but it failed to accurately predict the spectra observed by elements that contained multiple electrons. Something else was going on. We know now that the electrons in a real atom are a bit stranger 